Hi guys, welcome back. One of the things in the wake of the midterms that's become clearer to me, I felt this way before the midterms, but after the midterms, it just became crystal clear to me, is there are some issues that are unpopular to the general voting electorate, meaning not the 30% of Republicans who are very based Republicans, for lack of a better word. There are some issues that are unpopular. And the and the inclination of a lot of our Republican leaders is, okay, don't talk about those issues. Just leave them in the past, look to the future. They use this kind of trite, vague language. And I'm talking, obviously, about election integrity. I'm talking about abortion. But one of the things that became very clear to me after what happened, that we did not experience this red tsunami, is that it doesn't matter if some of these issues are unpopular with the general electorate. Republicans, especially elected Republicans, still have a responsibility to fight this corruption. Because if we don't expose the corruption, if we don't fight it, then it's not just going to go away. We can't just leave it in the past and let bygones be bygones. The people propagating the corruption, meaning the Democrats and the left, are going to do it again. And they're going to be emboldened and it's going to be worse and it's going to put our country in a much more dangerous position. So on that note, I want to bring in um, senior contributor to American Greatness, Julie Kelly, who has done absolutely incredible reporting on January 6th. I know a lot of people, Julie, are tired of talking about January 6th. I don't think we can talk about it, especially in the wake of the revelation from the FBI this week. Well, Liz, thank you so much for having me on. And we absolutely can't. And of course, the revelation is what um, I've been reporting on and other a handful of other journalists have been reporting on. And that is the very likely role of the FBI in what happened on January 6th and the months, weeks leading up to that. So what happened this past few weeks is in the two key trials, the Oath Keepers trial and the Proud Boys trial. The Oath Keepers trial has been going on since the end of September in Washington, D.C. The Proud Boys trial is set to begin in December. So as much as the government has wanted to conceal evidence of FBI involvement, or at least maybe foreknowledge of January 6th, as the trials commence, they have to turn over this information to defense under discovery rules, or they're supposed to anyway. So what came out interesting in the Oath Keepers trial is that the number two, the vice president, the person who reported directly to Stuart Rhodes, has been an FBI informant for months before January 6th. In the case of the Proud Boys, at least eight informants were embedded in that group months before January 6th. So, Liz, you could say one of two things. These were the worst informants in the world. How did the FBI ever find such horrible informants because they were planning this insurrection right under their noses and they never let law enforcement know? Or the second scenario, which I think is far more likely, is that this was replicating at the very same time what happened in the Whitmer kidnapping uh, entrapment scheme. And that was dozens of FBI supervising agents, undercover agents and informants entrapped these men to try to make it look like white supremacist militiamen loyal to Donald Trump tried to kidnap and kill one of his biggest political foes before the 2020 election. So um, I think this is raising some eyebrows. Christopher Ray testified on Capitol Hill on Tuesday and actually got some pretty tough questions from at least one Republican House member. And it. In my mind, at least, it begs the question, what is the purpose of an FBI informant? What's the purpose of federal law enforcement infiltrating Mm -hmm. groups that they suspect or have probable cause to believe have devious intentions, if not to stop those intentions before they become a reality? That's, it seems like an obvious question to me. Maybe you can tell me if I'm missing something. No, I think that's a question a lot of Americans have is, wait, what exactly is an FBI informant supposed to do? You know, you think uh, based on movies and TV shows, and of course, a lot of them are shady, but they infiltrate gangs or drug dealers or, you know, child trafficking, and they give the good guys information about the bad guys. The problem here is you've got the bad guys working with the bad guys to really, in some cases, entrap the good guys. That's what we saw pretty much in Whitmer. I'm not calling the men who were entrapped. I mean, they they were innocent. They didn't do anything wrong except, you know, kind of fall into this trap, some heated rhetoric um, in encrypted chats and online, et cetera. But certainly that is the case with January 6th. You know, Liz, the other thing that came out about the FBI informants, and you know this because you followed Russiagate, we just found out that the FBI offered Christopher Steele 
the author of the bogus dossier, a million dollars to verify the contents of the dossier. A lot of people don't know, Liz, that when Christopher Steele was working with the DNC in the Hillary Clinton campaign, when he was lobbying for Oleg Deripaska, the Russian oligarch, he also was an FBI informant. So this guy was getting money from all over the place, including the FBI, and then they wanted to pay him off to try to validate the contents of this dossier that they used to try to sabotage and destroy Donald Trump. The CHS program, they call it, confidential human sources, that's the technical term for informants, um, is rife with scandal and problems. Um, the DOJ's inspector general issued a report a few years ago, very lengthy, laying out all the problems in this. Do you know, Liz, I found out covering the Whitmer federal trial, informants are paid in cash. This is a $42 million per year plus um, program within the FBI, and these guys are all paid in cash. Right then and there should set off alarm, uh, you know, alarms and raise red flags for Americans and certainly lawmakers. But it looks like now FBI informants do very little uh, except for act as, you know, sort of these devices or these lures uh, on behalf of a, a weaponized uh, FBI to really target um, Trump supporters or people on the right. And in this hearing, by the way, FBI Director Christopher Wray, he was asked, two different times, not once, twice. Mm -hmm. And he refused to say whether FBI informants or whether FBI agents were actually disguised as Trump supporters or people who were worried about election integrity inside the Capitol. And he wouldn't, he wouldn't say yes or no. To me, that, that seems very obvious that there, there would be no reason for him mm -hmm. not to say no unless, it, unless it's true and he doesn't want to admit it. I was actually pretty shocked, Liz, to hear the questioning from Representative Higgins of Louisiana. He asked very specifically if there were FBI informants dressed as Trump supporters planted in the Capitol building before it was breached or the doors were open. He asked that question twice. Now, it kind of signals to me that perhaps Representative Higgins, as a member, member of the Homeland Security Committee, Maybe he has seen some of the secret surveillance video that we can't see. It's under protective orders. No one is allowed to see it except a DOJ and a few judges and defense attorneys and a few members of Congress. Maybe he saw that. But Liz, the point that Christopher Ray could not say no, what does that say? I mean, that was pretty shocking. What was even more ironic, Liz, is the person who cut off Representative Higgins' questioning and and bailed out Christopher Ray when he wouldn't answer. Benny Thompson, who is head of the January 6th committee, he's also head of the House Homeland Security Committee. He's supposed to be getting to the bottom of January 6th. He should have said, Christopher Ray, answer that question. I want to know. I'm supposed to tell the American people the truth about January 6th. Are you suggesting that the FBI put people disguised as Trump supporters in the Capitol building before the insurrection? No, he didn't. He rescued Christopher Ray. He cut off Representative Higgins, and that was the end of it, which just again suggests that, of course, the January 6th committee is not fact-finding. It's only going after Donald Trump, and a big part of it was to cover up what agencies like the FBI did before and on January 6th. Talk to me about those tapes for a second. If there's one person in Washington, D.C., perhaps besides President Biden, who is the ultimate arbiter of classified information, as all chief executives are, if there's one person aside from Biden who has the authority to release those tapes to the public, who would that be? The only person, Liz, who really could, the only people who could would be the head of the U.S. Um, Capitol Police. Those tapes technically belong to the Capitol Police. They are the ones who um, oversee the surveillance system. That is the entity that went to court to, um, to ask for these protective orders. So aside from the U.S. Capitol Police, which we know won't do it because they're Nancy Pelosi's, you know, secret police, except when they're supposed to be protecting her husband, then they're not around. But anyway, that's a whole other story. Um, the, the other people who could make that public would be the DOJ, because those tapes really technically belong to the DOJ now as evidence in their January 6th prosecution. That's not going to happen. However, there are a few House and Senate committees who do have access to that uh, surveillance. And you know what, Liz, at this point, 
doesn't matter what happens with the courts. It doesn't matter what happens with DOJ. Release those videos. It has been almost two years. You have thousands of hours of video that was captured on publicly funded uh, camera system in a publicly funded building. We are entitled to see what happened from that morning inside and outside on January 6th up until late that evening. Release it all. What are they hiding? It Wouldn't it be qualified as exculpatory evidence in these mm -hmm. trials? How can they have these trials without this information being available for the defendants who've been, in, many of them have been in prison for almost two years now before trial. Um, how can they even pretend that that's a fair trial without that evidence being on the table? Um, that's a great question, too. The problem, Liz, is that what I say these January 6th defendants are caught in a circle of hell in Washington, D.C. Um, they are now prosecuted by extremely powerful offices like the U.S. Attorney for the District of Columbia, Matthew Graves. Every single judge on the D.C. District Court, this is where every case is handled. They are all in on the insurrection narrative. They are nothing more than a rubber stamp for this DOJ, including judges appointed by Republican presidents, including Donald Trump's. Um, and so they have no relief. So I think even if defense attorneys would say, we want to see this whole, we want to see the, you know, six hours, seven hours of video before the first doors were breached, the first window was broken. We want to see who was opening the doors. We want to see were there plants in there. Now, it would be kind of, to your point, interesting at this point for some defense attorneys to go to court and say, this was a question Christopher Ray refused to answer. We want to see all the video. The thing is, it's left up to the judges. DOJ would come in and object to that, and the judges would say in practically every single case, no, you don't need to see it. That's, that is the rigged system Ugh, that these people are so dealing with. It's so unfair and they're doing it so blatantly. This is what I mean. This is what I meant at the beginning when I said, if we don't fully investigate this and understand the extent of the corruption, it's going to happen again because it's been proven. The left created this structure. It's been proven to work. Why wouldn't they deploy this against us. I mean, this this has similarities. You've noted this on Twitter. I'd like you to expand upon it a little bit, but you've noticed the similarity between what happened in the Gretchen Whitmer fednapping and what happened on January 6th related to these FBI infiltrators or undercover informants. Do you see that? Do you see even more similarities now that we've found out this information that the number two in one of the groups and as many as eight FBI agents were involved in another one of these groups? I absolutely do. And here's two comparisons. Number one, keep, as you know, the FBI official who ran the Michigan field office when all of this went down, a man named Stephen D'Antuano, his office was responsible for the main supervising agents and the main informant. He was promoted in October of 2020 after the arrests in that case were announced. And where did he go, Liz? He went to the FBI field office in Washington, D.C. So there, right then and there, you have a, a comparison. What happened, what we found out in the Oath Keepers case, that the number two of this so-called militia, who, by the way, brought no weapons to the Capitol on January 6th, like worst militia ever, um, that the number two in the Oath Keepers has been an FBI informant was for months, possibly years before January 6th. What happened in the Whitmer Fed napping is their main informant, Dan Chappell, was sworn in as the commanding officer, the number two, for the imaginary militia in Michigan that allegedly tried to kidnap and kill Gretchen Whitmer. That's just one one, two, three, ten similarities of all of these informants spread out in these so-called militias. And so those are just a few more of the ties. The other thing in the Oath Keepers case, and I know I'm getting a little in the weeds, but people can go to my reporting at amgreatness.com. What happened in the Whitmer case is you had the lead informant setting up encrypted chats, inviting his targets into these chats, and then provoking sort of really inflammatory incendiary conversations, sort of vetting out plans, what they might be able to do with Gretchen Whitmer. You have on January 1st, an unknown person on January 1st, 2021, who set up an encrypted um, communications called Zello. He set this up, invited a bunch of people in, including one of the current defendants. We still don't know the name of the person who set up this chat, 
made it public on January 6th, and now that is being used as evidence in this particular defendant's trial. Not only that, Liz, the judge doesn't care who it is. The government's going to try to conceal his name. And defense attorneys are so overwhelmed, quite frankly, with all the evidence, there's only so much they can ask for in court because they know 99% of the time they're not going to get it. So that's just another similarity. And it's really important to underscore this was all happening at the same time in 2020. These informants were run in the summer of 2020. The Fed napping case started to come together in early summer of 2020. So those aren't coincidences, right? That is why this whole thing has to be looked at. And I would actually start with the Whitmer case, to be honest. No, I mean, it's obviously not a coincidence. If you think it's a coincidence, you're naive. That's my fear, though, with who the current Republican leadership in both the House and the Senate um, are, that they don't understand the reality of the political opposition or the political enemy that we're facing. And if you don't understand the reality of what we're facing, then you're not going to fight back well. You're not actually going to fight the proper fight, which means you're going to lose the ultimate battle. I mean, you're in Washington, D.C. right now. Do you feel this same cynicism that I'm expressing? Oh, I definitely feel it with our side, right? The base is very afraid, especially now with this razor thin majority. I think if they felt like we had 30 or 40 seats, like we were expecting, this would be a no brainer. Now, I think the base justifiably is very nervous that these investigations that the House Republicans were promising before Election Day are now going to be excused away. Well, we don't have enough people to support it, et cetera. Um, but I was on Capitol Hill today. I heard from some House Republican members who are saying all of the right things. And I think pretty passionately, I think they finally recognize, and we have a trove of evidence now of the FBI's corruption and malfeasance. You finally have whistleblowers coming forward, which I think is critical. Um, and then Jim Jordan released that thousand page plus report right before election day, outlining what they had found out about the FBI. I was very gratified to see the Whitmer Fed napping case on there because what they said, and which is true, this was part of the FBI's manufactured evidence to support Christopher Ray's bogus claims that domestic violent extremists, i.e. Trump supporters, uh, posed you know, a dangerous threat to the country. So there's a lot of lines of inquiry. I hope that that doesn't get buried. I hope none of this gets buried. The COVID stuff is super important. Um, we need to get to the bottom of that. Um, but other things I, I would throw out there, the Hunter Biden laptop investigation. No, they did that before 2020. We have all the information about Hunter Biden. That's going to go nowhere. Um, there's some other things that I think uh, need to be deprioritized and make sure that this FBI DOJ is at the top of the list. Well, it feels from the outside like a drip, drip, drip of information. We want it to be an investigation that we can see all the new, all the new facts, all of the new revelations on a day by day basis. It's it's such a slow process that we really can't give up. We really can't let the energy be sucked out of this investigation. And many of the new revelations are thanks to your reporting. I highly recommend that everyone follow your Twitter account, follow your writing on American greatness. Julie Kelly, thank you so much for being with me today. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me on, Liz. If you haven't already, give this video a thumbs up, hit the subscribe button below, and ring the bell to make sure you never miss a video.